And how you guys doing? Welcome to the show. We got a great guest, man. We got the god of freaking uh, Miles himself. We got the uh, Scooter Tramp Scotty hanging out with us today. We're going to be talking to him and uh, seeing where he's at, all that good stuff. Uh, let is us welcome Scooter Tramp Scotty onto the program. What's up, Scotty? Not much, guys. What you call me? The god of what? The God of Miles, man. Holy oh, cow. <laughs> oh, okay. Man. You're an asphalt eater, man. <laughs> How long you been on the road, man? Tw full time, 25 years. Holy I left in the spring of 95. Spring of 95. You know, for those that don't know uh, who you are, give them a background of your story because it's one of the uh, the best Scooter Tramp uh, st stories I know of, man. Uh, just give them a little background, why you left, why you decided uh, to leave the rat race and all that good stuff. All right. Um, well, by the time I was in my late 20s, you know, I... I come from a, more, a simpler background, but by the time I was in my late 20s, I thought I would try the American dream. Uh, I'm a roofer by trade, or at least I was. I'm kind of old for that now. And I got the three-bedroom house with the two cars and the truck and the washing machine and the furniture and the color TV and all of that stuff. And for a lot of my friends that worked, for me, it I hated it. And the problem was this little basket of bills that was on top of the refrigerator. And every month I'd put that thing on the table and I'd uh, start going through it to see what I could pay and what I couldn't. And, you know, there was a, a bunch of different things that happened. But it, in my case, it made me miserable. It made me poor. I think that the real definition of wealth is when you find that you like yourself more often than you don't. And you even think you're a really cool person some of the time, or at least somebody you like being around. And you find that you like your life more often than you don't. And you're even excited or ecstatic about it some of the time. Because nobody's those things all the time. So that place was making me poor. And through a series of different things that happened, I left there. And I bought a small Airstream trailer. It was 30 years old. I paid $1,100 for it. This was in 1990, I think. And I put it on a friend's property. My mother used to do this when we were kids. And my buddy charged me 150 bucks a month to keep it there, and I hooked it all up, and I got rid of absolutely everything I didn't actually use. And all of a sudden, life got really easy. All my bills were about 160 bucks a month, and all of a sudden, I was working too much. I was making too much money. I owned the little business, and so I began to. It didn't make sense, so I began to work two to three weeks and take two months off. And I'll tell you what, you guys, I got bored. And I started looking for different things to do. And I tried a lot of different things, but I really hit on motorcycle travel. I'd always had the bike. That was one thing I did not get rid of. And I started going with friends, and then I started going alone. And the trips started getting, they started off with just a few weeks here, or a week here, 10 days there. I'd go over to Arizona. And the trips got longer and longer, and I started hating coming home. Then I started just hating being home. When I was home, all I wanted to do was leave again. And so I began looking for ways to stay gone. Now, I didn't know if that was possible. So I'd never heard of anybody doing it before. Sorry, guys, but I'm holding this phone by hand here, you know. <laughs> Anyways, so, so, you know, I was the first time I took off for a month was in 1991. And after that, I the the next up until 95 i guess i took off in the summers and just wouldn't come back and sometimes i'd run out of money and keep going which was weird but that worked and so i began to look what i wanted was i didn't want a life of sleeping on picnic tables in a park you know that's okay for you know a trip or even for a summer but as a way of life it really wasn't happening so I was looking to try to engineer a way of life that was comfortable enough to work as an everyday long-term lifestyle. And I achieved that a long time ago. Once in a while, somebody asked me if I wanted to settle down, and I'm like, I've tried it a few times. I thought maybe I wanted to. 
But for me, it's much too hard of a life. This is much easier. And the thing is, I get bored. Those are the two problems. What was the biggest thing that scared you when you first decided that you wanted uh, to live on the road? What type of things came to mind that Marty gave you pause? <laughs> I had a real problem with uh, doubting my sanity. <laughs> Nobody else was doing this back then. <laughs> and uh, I guess money, I was worried about money, the same as everybody. My sanity, one of the things that really helped was when I met Panhead Billy, because he didn't doubt his sanity, and he'd been on the road longer than me. But back then, I didn't know anybody else who'd been on the road full time. So now there's you know, a handful of guys who do it. Do you think so, it's become a different lifestyle? Because if you, you know, you're on YouTube, which by the way, everybody go visit Scotty's YouTube channel. It's awesome. I'm a regular watcher of it. Uh, you're seeing it a lot now where people are doing what you're doing, but not on motorcycles, but in vans. Do you think people are starting to wake up to there's more to life than the rat race? I don't know, but it's a big trend. People are hitting the road all over. I had a girlfriend who lived on her bike for eight years, and she told me a long time ago, she said, there's going to be a lot more people coming out and doing this. And I told her she was nuts. <laughs> I said, no way. And it turns out she was right. So I don't know. But there's also a good handful that live on bikes. They all show up at the Sturgis rally. It's kind of like the hobo, you know, like when the freight train hobos all meet once a year for their convention. It's kind of like that. <laughs> Some of them are seasonal. There's only a couple that are a few, a very few that are full time all year round. But do you uh, have have you rode all fifty states by now? Uh, I've never been in Rhode Island. <laughs> and I didn't ride Hawaii, although I did go there because my mom lives there. I've gone to visit her. Oh, okay. Rock on. And you're really big into Mexico. Those are my favorite videos uh, that you do on your YouTube channel is uh, when you're down in Mexico. What got you to fall in love with going down there all the time? Oh, that's an easy one. I follow the weather. I'm a snowbird. And the winters push you down against the coast. All you really have to try to stay warm warm enough to live in a camp all year because the camps are great unless the weather weather becomes really adverse really hot or really cold ruins it otherwise it's good living i think so you still so arizona southern arizona and southern california deserts they get really cold at night and the nights are long and then you have southern florida which is the only really place that really stays warm in the winter and so you're like stuck for six or seven months man and I just got sick of that shit. I started pushing over the border. But then once you spend some time in Mexico, you find out it's nothing like the media says. You make you realize you can't believe a single word the media says. It's like stepping back in time into the 80s. Oh, man, we all know about the, the media and the stuff. Oh, don't even get me started on them. Uh, so you like going down to Mexico. Have you ever wanted to take one of them rides where you just leave the States and go to the tip of like uh, our South America or any of that type of stuff? Have you ever ventured into Central America or is it just too dangerous for us gringos? Oh, I've known plenty of gringos who's ridden down there. So I obviously it can be done, but I'm not really interested in seeing the world and you can only, you can only be on the road seeing everything for so long before it kind of gets old. I watch that happen with the new guys. I travel slow. I stay in places longer. So the first years, I had what I called high mileage years where I was all over the place wearing out tires like crazy, you know. How do I get this camera to work straight? There it is, I think. And, and those were good years. But eventually, just going everywhere – and seeing everything gets old. And at that point, you know, there comes a point for most guys where you just feel lonely and lost. You don't have any real friends, just the guy you met in the gas station and talked to for 20 minutes. And it becomes really painful. Most guys will quit at that point, and I don't blame them. But for the guys who keep going, things change. And what it changed for me was I'll come into your town, 
I'll find a good place where I'm going to put my camp. I'll hook up with the gym so I can get showers every day. And I will um, begin to do the social stuff. I have a routine. Everybody's been on the road a long time as a routine when they come to a new town. And I'll become a local and I'll begin to meet people and do the local things. And what it is is you're a reality hopper. It's like you ever seen that show Quantum Leap? You're leaping into these other worlds and in other people's worlds. And because you have more time, you're not really a tourist. Because locals don't really see themselves in a tourist. A tourist living extravagantly doesn't have much time. But a guy who doesn't have a lot of money and is around for a while, you know, he's, it's more interesting. He's on the road. And so I become a local. So it's, you, do, you dive into different realities, man. I'm living in Key West, hanging with the people that live on boats. And then I'm in the mountains or I'm in Mexico or I'm in South Dakota. It's a whole different thing. How is uh, living on the road going uh, place to place where you've been? How has COVID in 2020 until now affected uh, what judgments you do, uh, who you go by, all that good stuff? When they started COVID, they completely – can I cuss on this show? <laughs> <laughs> A little bit <laughs> before YouTube goes – you know how they are. I know how they are. They completely fucked me because <laughs> I come to your town. I come to, to different places and I go to events. I learned from Panhead Billy how important events are. But I come to a place and find a camp, hook up with a gym, do social events. And, you know, I work at home now. I spend a lot of time at home. I work from the computer and all that now. And I'm lazy in the mornings. And so they shut everything down. So here I am going from town to town and just – camping in different places and taking baths and creeks and rivers and whatever I found. Right. So to adapt, what I began to do was people invite me to their homes a lot, but I usually don't go because honestly, I want to go to my home. <laughs> I feel at home at my home. Not like I'm in somebody's house. So I started taking people up on their offers. That's worked out good. I still go back and visit a lot of people now. So that's what I did. And then well, I skipped across the border, and in Mexico, they weren't shutting everything down too much and all that. So last year. Right. Well, you as a YouTube creator, before I go to uh, the rest of the panel, you're doing what a lot of us are doing. You're heading over to Odyssey. You're heading over to BitChute and, uh, you know, the other platforms. We just got a Roku channel. That way we don't have to deal with the censorship over here. Uh but what got you into the other platforms? Is it the same thing that we are all experiencing with uh, the censorship? Censorship is un-American. It's unconstitutional. Zucker Dick said, said, censored me one time, and I moved to MeWe. I won't go back. And it's not good for because I have this channel and all that. So it's not been good for me. But patriotism is not walking down the street carrying a flag singing the national anthem. Patriotism is doing the right thing by your people and your country, not necessarily your government. I looked up the word in the dictionary. It's, it's doing these things even when you have something to lose. Very and well. I had to make a decision. I had to make a decision. I still have to do YouTube. If I had my way, everybody would go to Odyssey, but I can't make them do that or one of the other platforms. Right. Uh, foundational black American, uh, he asks, how much was gas back then when you first started? <laughs> I don't know, but I do remember one time going to the gas station and they wanted six bucks to fill my five gallon tank. And I was so pissed off. <laughs> <laughs> I, <don't know. laughs> I went in there and ran in and raved about it, you know? So right. I don't remember that <laughs> now you could put, you know, 12 bucks or Sometimes 15, you know, when the price is up. So, How is it in Mexico? It's about the same. The about gas. the same. Their gas don't have ethanol in it, so their gas is better than ours in general. Right. Well, we're going to go to our panel. Jay, man, you're up first. What you got for Scotty? Got to put your mic on, man. <laughs> You had it all. <laughs> anyway, uh, speaking of Panhead Billy, uh, how's he been? You know, he's 
he's getting old and it's catching up to him. I can see that. This year, the last two years, he showed up at Sturgis with the old panhead because I always see him there. But he's got a pickup truck, and I think he's moving around in that now. But he's still sleeping on the ground. I got a picture of his bed somewhere with a tarp and, a, and just a regular sleeping bag right on the concrete. That's where I seen yeah. him in the doorway of Randy's place. Randy sells used parts out there, he, and he's he's one of our one of the guys. And he, uh, Billy sleeps over at his place. Randy owns a house there, and he's got a walkway going in right. And when it's raining, Billy slides up underneath there. <laughs> but I think his health's catching, his age is catching up to him. Right, it does to all of us. This That's year, a- he yanked the engine out of the pan. Had I helped him a little bit with it. Because Randy's got a shop there. Uh, Randy's got uh, Sturgis Swap Meat. He sells used parts. He's got a pretty big piece of land there. So a lot of people come stay on his land. I don't, but a lot of people do. And uh, I helped him pull the engine out. He's doing a complete rebuild on it again. He's doing the bottom end. Bedlam, you're up for Scotty. All right. Uh, Man, I got a list of questions I could be asking you, Scotty. I've been a long time follower of yours on YouTube and so forth, and some of your old magazine articles too. But, oh, you uh, remember you damn your old? I'm not that old. I'm not old. I'm not over fifty yet, but I still got magazines. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, I got uh, I got a, yeah, I got quite a few questions from other people. Uh, one in particular was a female writer. And uh, she asked, she wanted me to ask you, do you think it would be safe for a female, female drifters now, as in this time frame? You know? Man, I, I would suggest, it's, it's no more dangerous now than it's ever been. I would suggest that, what's her name? Uh, well, she didn't ask me to give her name. <laughs> so. Oh, okay, I thought, you know, whatever, if, I don't know if she's watching. I would suggest going and watching some of Itchy Boots. Have you guys ever watched Itchy Boots? She yeah. sounds familiar. No, it's oh, she, Huh? Is it, is it Itchy Boots here on YouTube? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. She's traveling around the world on her motorcycle by herself, and she's been doing that for a few years. And that's what her uh-huh. channel is. Now, she's, I think, from Sweden or something. But she does her, all of her videos in English. So I've known a few. As a matter of fact, I'll tell you what, you guys. I don't make a whole lot of videos because it's like, too, it's like full-time work. If you make them, you know what that's like. You're working like every week. You're working hard to put them out. And I don't really need to because my life's inexpensive. But um, there are a few drifters out there that some are working very hard to bring you their stuff like itchy boots but there are a couple out there i know that don't want anybody knowing them barbara jean has been on the road for many many years i see her at sturges every year i saw her there this year she goes to the she takes care of a house that a bunch of guys come to and um she's a real wild broad and she asked me once she said scotty she said why you want to do all that work take all this you know, to take all this, all these videos and stuff you're doing to these people, why don't you just go enjoy what you're doing? And so, see, I am somewhere in between Itchy Boots, who works very hard to bring you what she's doing, and Barbara Jean, who doesn't want to get involved in that. She just wants to go enjoy what she's doing. There's another guy I know out there doing the same thing. I'm in the middle. So I think so, because there's women doing it. All right, go. Go ahead, Bedlam. You got a couple more. Go for it. Man. Uh, okay. This is a morbid question. I don't know why somebody wanted me to ask this, but yeah, it was in regards, since you're on the road, how would you, okay, I don't I don't know if you got like a, uh, a base or how would you handle it as far as like an emergency situation? Say like, you know, I know you're getting up there at age. Say like you're over the road drifting and you find one of your uh, lonely spots, but yet you're not able to get out due to an emergency, heart attack, whatever. But, you know, <laughs> I mean, what what would you end up doing? That's the question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess I'd die there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> 
<laughs> I mean, I got a telephone. Everybody's got one of them now. Well, yeah, but that, I mean, that, that it was a morbid question on how it was asked to me because I was told him I was like, well, he's been over the road for twenty five plus years. He would just not get out. <laughs> he would just be stuck there. <laughs> Well, so, what would be the difference if that happened to you in your house? Well, that somebody would eventually stumble stumble across me. Yeah. Me. But if you're out in the boonies or out in one of these abandoned places like I know you do in your videos, what's the odds? I guess I'd call somebody. Well, you I got my bike stuck trying to get out of one of them places. <laughs> I've been stuck before. Once I was so stuck, it was like four hours to get out. I didn't think I was going to be able to. And there was nobody to help me. I finally had to figure it out. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was, I did, I made it, I did a magazine uh, article about that. That was before the videos, but oh yeah. my God, I'd never seen nothing like it before. Yeah. The way I was stuck. It was amazing. I've been, I've been stuck lots of times, but not like this. Yeah. How is uh, it's how, how you bring up because uh, you were doing magazine articles and we're to go to Dark Soul next? How did video? How did YouTube change everything for you? Easy Rider Biker Magazine. They used to actually pay money, so it was worth it. I would get six to twelve hundred dollars an article, depending how long. But. There was a couple of things. I was a young man out running around the country chasing women. I mean, they were a major part of it back then. And going to all these events and having a good time. And I just, it was too much work. So I was not consistent. So I was just a contributor. I think one time I had two things in it the same, on the same month. Because I needed money. I told the editor, I said, pay me for both of those because I'm going to Mexico. That's what I was doing. So he did. <laughs> but yeah, but. It was harder because it was all film. You had to develop the film, go through the pictures, and then it was all done through the mail. And so the video just, it, it was really the, uh, the new cameras, you know, the digital cameras. That made it easy. Right. And it, YouTube was an accident. I didn't, that was, I st a girlfriend started a YouTube thing for me. I know how to make that stuff, man. I'm an Neanderthal. She started it 10 or 15 years ago. And the reason was is because guys were asking me, how come you get to travel? How do you find you don't have to work all the time? You get to go all these places. And it's because my expenses are low, you know. And how do you find these places you sleep? And I originally just made a few videos. My real early ones are just me throwing the camera around, showing you where I'm sleeping and how I found it. And then I put something up once, twice a year, maybe. And then one year I went out to visit my dad before he died just a couple of years ago because he had a bad heart. We knew he was going to die. And while I was in L.A., a bunch of people stopped me and they were like, Scotty, I follow you. And I'm like, really where? Because I was doing Cycle Source magazine at the time and it was YouTube, all of them, all of them. And then I was like, oh, that's the big deal. Then I was crossing the country and I stopped to visit a friend of mine in Houston. And he's a computer guy. And he said, look, man, why don't we put a. A donate button on that video thing here. I'm telling you, it wasn't me. And I said, you know how to do that? And he said, I can figure it out. And he did. And I was like, all right. And it makes enough money for me to live on. So I'm like, oh, I got a new job. I mean, you know, my expenses are low. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> but it makes enough. I mean, I can get gas and I can eat, you know, and do laundry and everything's cool. That's all I care about. I don't, I do not have the disease of more. I don't want more than I actually need. Right. Dark soul. You're up. Uh, you pretty much answered. I was going to ask you about the Easy Rider uh, magazine, but you pretty much answered that part. Well, here's my other question. Uh, what number bike you're on right now? You've been doing this for a long time. I actually started on a soft tail, but my first full year on the road, that winter, I guess it would have been this winter of what, 90, 95. In the winter, I stayed in Arizona and Tucson. And that bike was just killing me. It was an old, well, it wasn't old when I got it. I got it in 1990. It was an 87, right? But those things are solid mounted. It was a hard ride. They have a solid mounted engine. And I put an ad in the newspaper that I wanted to trade it. And somebody traded it to me for the bagger I used to ride, which I rode for, I think, 19 years, 18, 19 years. I retired it with 536000 on it. And I'm a, I'll tell you guys something. Don't ever do that. It's not worth it. 
bike was falling apart. <laughs> so this is the third one. <laughs> and I got this bike by accident. So five. There's an old saying. Huh? Go ahead. There's an old saying: Do what you do it. You, it what you truly love to do because you truly love to do it, and the money will come. It seems like I have a good guardian angel. I worked the motorcycle rallies for all them years. That's how I made a living. But I only would have to work. I began to get better and better jobs working at the rallies. I learned that from Panhead Billy because that's what he used to do. And I began to where I only had to work so many a year. I'd work about a month, month and a half if you included the traveling time. And that was it for the winter. So I lived on very little money, but I never ran out. And I don't know why. People ask me about money. That's one of the first questions. Usually I'm surprised you guys haven't asked about that. It's okay. You know, I don't mind. <laughs> we we pretty, uh, pretty much answer it in one of your videos that I watched uh, about, really about two years ago. And it resonates with what you said just now. Uh, you get out there and it'll come to you. And you found the way of doing it. And I, I, I actually envy you in the way as I've been in this rat race, uh, driving truck all over the world, you know, around the United States. And I understand being in the lonely part and you get your moments and, but what you do, I'm planning on going that route here. I just got to work some things out. Well, you got my phone number, I think. So anybody can have my phone number who wants it. And, um, Guys talk, called to talk to me about being on the road. I just had a guy come here and stay a night. He rode from Florida up here to North Carolina. And I had a guy come visit me in Florida this year. He stayed with me a couple of weeks. He rode a long way to get there. He's still on the road. He's wanting to get rid of his house. He's doing the exact same thing. He's a young guy. Rock on. He's a gearhead with a bagger. You know, he's. Hey, so well, you I'm know always open to share what I know. Huh? That's a question that I got for you, Scotty, before I go to Grace. Star. Why was it always a Harley? You know, you hear about how gold wings are just like the Cadillac at a road and soft on you. Have you ever thought about something other than a Harley? <laughs> if I was going to go high tech, I probably would go to a gold wing. But... There's a couple things. I got into Harleys before they were popular. And as a matter of fact, the cops used to hassle us all the time. The citizens, they, they used to call them, their attitude was, get off that murder cycle, boy. Don't ride those things and get yourself a job and a wife and a life, you know. And the bikes were wild and they were a, they had a wild feeling because I had Jap bikes. I had a couple of Suzuki's and some different stuff. But the Harleys had a wild, untamed feeling about them. And I really liked that. And so their persona, their image at the time was the rebel, um, the uncompliant, you know, that's not anymore. Now they represent the old guy, <laughs> that changed. But when I got into them, they were a symbol of nonconformity. And uh -huh. so I liked them and I liked the way they felt. I fell in love with the way they feel now I stay with them. I ride these old baggers because it's the most simple bike on the road. To change an air filter in a Goldwing is a four-hour job by the book. Now, I'm putting together an engine over here out of parts, and it ain't like that. This is the simplest damn bike there is, and I'm not the greatest mechanic. I've had a couple breakdowns in Mexico this last winter. I had a couple things. One of them was a flat tire, but and I fixed it down there. There's not much I can't do to this thing. They're so goddamn simple. Once you start taking the older bikes apart and look in them, I ride the Evos. They're the simplest thing Harley ever built, except for some of their really early stuff. They're simpler and have less moving parts than a panhead or a knucklehead. They're even easier in some ways to work on than a shovelhead, and they have good longevity. They just don't have a lot of power. So you start taking them apart, it's like hillbilly stuff. You're in there mm -hmm. going, well, duh. It's like that mousetrap game, you know, where one thing moves another. It's like that. If you, I don't know, if you guys work on them, you know this. If you get into them, you know this. <laughs> They're so goddamn right. simple. I need to keep be able to fix it, man. Our right. breakdown, my breakdowns, I've had more breakdowns on the side of the road than most of the people I know have had in their life. 
You know, I put a starter drive gear in my starter in a gas station. It took me about an hour and a half. I asked the Harley shop, how much to put in a starter drive gear? They told me 425 bucks. I had one on me. I just put a belt on. I just popped the belt down there in Georgia. You just busted a belt. Yeah, I put it. I had one in the saddlebag. I put another one on it the next day. <laughs> Gray Star, what's up? Turn on your mic. Sorry about that. I got a couple questions. First one is uh, I was watching your video where you kind of explained your life and you had mentioned that when you were a kid, you were in communes. And I'm curious about as to where those were located. Santa Cruz area by chance? Yeah, man. Santa I Cruz, had, great star. I've had some uh, hot tub parties at Aptos before. I could totally relate. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was a little kid, man. I was a awesome. little kid. Yeah, that's awesome. My second question mainly is, uh, what do you do as far as a home base for like mail? I'm sure you still have bills to pay, don't you? Some. No. Really? <laughs> what bill? I got to pay for this telephone. That's it. So you don't. What really bill would I have? So no mail. Huh? What about if the government sends you something, a social security card or something? Well, I have a friend in New Orleans, and she takes care of things like that for me, but there really isn't much, you know? That's good. I mean, well, I have, a, I have a Montana license plate. Those are permanent. My insurance is $75 a year, you know? I mean, I just – I just after Sturges, within a month or two after Sturges, I need to look at and get a hold of them and pay the bastards, and that's it. You know, that's it. That's all there is. I don't have that. What else is there? Man, I envy you. I get my teeth fixed in Mexico and that kind of thing, you know. Do you do a lot of health care out, out in Mexico or do you uh, come up here for it? Health care for what? Well, if you have any uh, problems that you need to do. <laughs> I love it. The, only, I love the only problem is my teeth, my eyes now, right? But these are like readers is what they are. So, um the one thing that I get is I get staph infection sometimes. And the doctors told me, yeah, there's no cure for this. Some people just get it and they have it. Once you have it, it's in your system and it comes back for some people. And, you know, it's in the air. They told me it's in the air all the time. Just some people are and whatever. They're prone to getting it. So while I'm in Mexico, I buy the antibiotics for it and I keep them on me. And once every couple of years or something, those will come up. That's it. I mean, and I don't have nothing else. Not yet. I get the Go. usual aches of being old. You know, I'm 61, right? Right. Well, going I through was, state by going through state by state, what's the different cultures, if you will, going through state by state and the way people think in this country, especially now? What the difference is now is between the red states and the blue states. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? When you right. go into the red states, everybody. Like South Dakota, they never closed, man. I go to get my hair cut at the barber shop, and they're talking about the New World Order and all that stuff. They're talking; they they they're more wise. In the blue states, people seem to be more in the dark about what's going on. Mm. Uh, so do they? Uh, that's what treat I see. You different? Do you get more? Not uh, too much. A red or a blue? For hospitality. The blues mellowed out some because I'm in a blue state this year, and they're not all screaming at you if you're not wearing a mask anymore. <laughs> they were last year. I couldn't. I lo I love this town when I first came here, but over the years it's gotten funky. And last year I couldn't stand it. They had the whole mm -hmm. BLM painted downtown on the walls and everything boarded up, and it was horrible, man. Absolutely horrible what these people do to themselves. Just because I bet. The television telling them to do this to themselves, and they do it, and they, they get miserable. So in the red states, people tend to be happier, that's for sure, nowadays. Because these guys Amen. stress themselves out by doing what the television tells them to do. And then they screw up their own living conditions, and then they're unhappy, and they get bitchy. I've seen this. I see that. Mm -hmm. The Jay red man, states are more relaxed. Damon, what are you doing, man? I'm just sitting here listening to you. <laughs> um, Are you up? Uh, speaking of, without giving too many um, spoilers away, 
you're rebuilding your engine. Are you going to be putting that out on YouTube? I don't think so. I think I may do one on just how to install a cam in an Evo because there's a couple of things to know about it that aren't known very much anymore. And when you put one in, they're, they're pretty simple, but there's a couple things to know to get it in there and get it to be quiet and working right. Yeah. But I don't think I'm going to do the whole engine. It wasn't a whole engine rebuild, and I haven't even filmed putting the top end on. You could get that out of a book. There's probably somebody who's made that video before. And I usually try to do mechanical videos on stuff that I really know well. I did one on carburetors, right? I looked up carburetors, and all the people were talking about them were wrong. <laughs> I've been using that same TV carburetor for 30 years. I'm like, don't put a kit in it. The kits aren't any good. We learned that a long time ago. And then how to tune them. But that's because I know it. And I have to happen to be working on the bike to make them. Some guy asked me, he said, do more on working on your bike. I'm like, not unless it breaks, brother. <laughs> <laughs> I ain't taking it apart for no reason. But no, not the engine, though. But maybe the cam. Right. <laughs> And I've got a lot of other material I'd rather do. I like the gypsy stories, you know. I've got more of that one in Mexico I'd like to do. And I can really just go through my old videos that are on, like, a hard drive and just pick stuff off of it if I want to. I just i am not going to go back full time into the rat race. I'm not going to work making videos every week. I tried that. It's just, like, a lot of work. Oh, you got that right. Bedlam, what do you got? You know. I always enjoy, I, I always right. enjoy when... <laughs> My notifications pop up and it says Scooter Tramp Scotty. I uh, know I'm going to get a good one. <laughs> good. Good. I appreciate that you've watched more than one. <laughs> I really appreciate that. <laughs> I think all of us do, man. We all wait for yeah. your notifications. You're, you're an really? asphalt. You're and a I, I, check, I, check, I, check his, I check his YouTube page daily. <laughs> Really? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we all like, did you get a new one? <laughs> you know, I'm so surprised by that. I really am. That people yeah. like like this stuff. Don't yeah. Be. I'm so surprised by Don't that. Be. Don't be. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised at all. I mean you do you do great content, you know. I, I love watching it. And you know, I, I wish can... I could get out just like that, but I got a little bit of extra responsibilities here, so I have to deal with That's what good. I got first. You know, just like everybody else, usually, if, if they're lucky enough to ride like they can or ride like you, they're damn good and lucky. That's all I got to say, you know. But as far as, uh, you know, it, it brings me up to this, you know, you inspire a lot of riders, you know, to actually get out and ride more. That's what it boils down to. And. You know, I mean, since you inspire so many riders, who actually inspires you, though? Besides inspire you? who? Who actually inspires you? Who inspired you to even take to take this route? Or was it just a thought to do it? I was a fan of Marla Garber. But she's not actually who inspired me. When I used to live in the trailer, there was a couple who used to go on motorcycle trips a lot. And he knew they had situated their lives simple and inexpensive so they could. Fitz and Vicky, and I don't know where they are anymore, but Fitz knew that I had time and a bike. And so he would always call me and say, we're going somewhere. And we'd ride 500 miles out, stay four days, and ride 500 miles back to a, an event. But I, was, I would say Marla Garber. Any of you guys know who she was? Mm -mm. Never heard of her. She wrote, she wrote for Super Cycle Magazine. She lived on her bike for eight years before she died in a motorcycle accident. She was a Canadian girl, and she was a nice looker. And I didn't care for her material that much, but I was inspired by her. Full time, she lived out there. She, she was from Ontario. You can Google her, and you can, there's not a whole lot on her, but she's still there. And she always rode a bagger. When I started riding baggers, they were so not cool. But because Marla rode one, I decided she was cool and I could ride one because I was traveling so much, you know. Yeah. Mm. So that would be it. Her and then Panhead Billy helped me a lot just because just being who he is, you know. Okay. I mean, that answers my question. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Marla Garber, man. Yeah, you yeah, can put her in. I'll, I'll definitely have to look her up. Yeah, so I started, you know, I didn't, I never knew, I was a young man, 
And I was out doing all these things, and I was excited, and I wanted to share it with people. And when Marla died, she died in 1995, I wrote down a couple little things, and I sent them to her magazine. But I didn't know that Supercycle had – when Supercycle died with her. She must have been holding that magazine together. It had been bought out by Easy Rider. Easy mm -hmm. Rider owned five magazines. The next thing I know, I'm talking to the editor of Biker. And they had this one new guy – who really liked my material. The magazines weren't interested in it. They want to do the mainstream stuff. They weren't interested yeah. in on the full full time on the road thing. But this one associate editor was, and he pulled crazy strings to get me printed. It was shocking. Some of the stuff I turned in didn't have, I didn't have pictures for it. And for the fiction, they would get fiction stories. They'd get an artist to draw a picture for it. And the editor told Stan, "I'll print this for you, Stan, but I'm not paying an artist." So Stan sent two copies into the prisons and got the prison artists to draw the pictures. And then when the stuff got more popular, uh, the editor for Easy Rider, Dave Nichols, picked it up. And he got three, uh, three paintings done, three pictures done by Dave Mann. You guys remember him? Oh, yeah. I have yep. three original pieces of art for three of my stories from Dave Mann. So it was really hard to get my foot in that door. But I did it. My point is I did it because I wanted to share what I was doing. I wanted to inspire people to do follow their heart and do what they wanted to do, regardless of what that was. And if nothing else, I wanted to entertain them. And I didn't even know they were going to pay me. Right. And YouTube's the same way. This is why I'll never sell out. My main motivation is never money. Mm -hmm. Now I'm you making know a living at it, so I'm really happy about that. I hate work and motorcycle rides. I'm so sick of it. <laughs> Well, you know what, you know, you were kind of surprised that people watch your, all your videos as soon as they come out. I think a lot of people are living through you because they're so envious of the position that you're in to be able to do all this kind of stuff. Would you agree? That's what they tell me, Mr. Hollywood. <laughs> you know, they used to call me Hollywood, man. That's what the vendors called me way back when I first started. They all called me Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's what they tell me. But, you know, I think most people wouldn't like this. I think most guys would just really be happy with a month or two to be able to go on the road a year, a month or two, and, call, and then go home. Because, you know, mm -hmm. contentment is where you find it. Like you were saying, Bedlam, you have a lot of things going on, but contentment is where you find it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, I, I, I get home. Could be in a family. Who cares? Yeah. Who cares? I mean, there's, there's, there's days where I'll come home on the bike from work and just want to pack up and keep going. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm just like everybody, everybody else most of the time. So, yeah, there you go. Dark cell. I say, way well, that I just like Bedham said, I come home and I basically want to go and get out and stuff. So, uh, each year I'm able to start doing more and more about getting out there and enjoying my bike even more uh and with uh illinois uh last year did a great deal and this coming year we got uh what uh five events going on belt and bedlam that we're going to be hitting up and we're going to get together four so four just you know with the, the, this group and then i got my friends around here that we'll do about three or four things going on around here in my town so uh getting out there and, and slowly start chipping away the stuff here to be able to get out there and travel and enjoy life the way you said uh life is too short and you you've you get out there and see it and that's the biggest thing i enjoy it and like uh hollywood says uh through you and a few other creators are actually doing some uh they'll uh it's get to see places where we could stay at and campgrounds. It uh, basically plans out, you know, where other people who want to get out there and do it. There's a lot of bike guys out there now. A lot of uh, video creator guys, a lot of different subjects. Well, where being on the road all the time, being on the road all the time, I'll tell you what happens is I'm mellower now because I'm older. When I was younger, I read some of my old stuff. I was just like, I was just extreme for any weird adventure, anything. Anytime it got strange, I chased it like a like a dog after a rabbit. I, I read some <laughs> of my old stuff. I'm like, who is this guy? <laughs> Whether it was a crazy woman or some strange event, and it made for really good stuff. But stuff happens out here whether you want it to or not. It just 
little adventures come your way, the ones that you could never plan. It's strange. You know, so there's like these places of these times that's kind of boring, interrupted by these great adventures that happen. I will, I could never put them all together and I certainly could never write them all. There's just, I'm shocked when I look at all my old pictures from when I had filmed. I took a lot of pictures because of the magazine thing and I'm just shocked so much can happen in such a short time. So Where you, is the weirdest place you've ever stayed? I'll, I'm sorry, Dark, so you can go after. Where is the weirdest place? Oh, my God. I, that'd be hard to pick from. <laughs> Especially in the early days. I, when I didn't know what I was doing, I stayed in some weird-ass places. But uh, one was in an abandoned factory because it was raining in Colorado. And that place just had the screw most screwball vibe. But I've stayed in so many strange places I couldn't even begin to tell you wow. mostly if there's a storm you know and i'm i want to get under something you know what i had happened at the beginning of the COVID thing i was coming out of mexico it was starting to rain and there was this i pulled off and there's a you know not much of a town there's some stores and stuff but behind this one building that looked like nobody used it there was like a big overhang where you could drive a tractor in it there's like a metal roof so i'm under there and i slept and this cop wakes me up at like two in the morning, three in the morning. He says, dude, what are you doing here? He said, you can't stay here. He said, what are you doing? I, you know, I told him it's right at the beginning of the COVID. I go, well, I started feeling a little sick. <laughs> <laughs> and so I wanted to pull off and get some sleep. That fucking, he took three immediate steps backwards, man. I'm trying to not laugh. Right. And <laughs> he goes, he goes, well, you got, I mean, it was just comical. He goes, well, you, you can't stay here. You got to go. I go, okay. So he leaves and I go back to sleep, right? So he wakes me up in the morning, I early in the morning, but he won't get out of his truck. He drives his truck by. And there's some, <laughs> an interesting one that happened this year, north of Puerto Vallarta in Mexico. I found not very far north on the north end of the city. I found a, a place to sleep. I wanted to go into the city in the daytime, but I'm still actually kind of in the city, but not in the middle of it yet. So I found this dirt road going off to the right, and then it would hang a left, and there were some trees. It was a perfect, beautiful place to stay. But when you hung the corner, the road was so rutted, I didn't know I was going to be able to get my bike through there. But I made it in there that night. I went to sleep. The next day, I go into Puerto Varda, and I, I met this dentist that I really liked, and I had him fix my teeth. And then there was a lot of stuff going on in the evening. So I hung around there, and I didn't get back home till 3 in the morning. I pull into this thing, go around the corner, Drop the bike on its side. I can't pick it up, man. I unloaded everything off it. And it's 3 in the morning. I can see my spot. I just want to go to bed. And finally, I get my tools out, take a file, and dig out underneath the, the, both the wheels. And I could pick it up for some reason. I go in there and make camp. Next day, I'm like, you know, I'm not leaving here early. I'm going to stay here until I want to leave. So it's probably 10 or 11 in the morning. And I hear a guy yelling at me. And I look out through the trees. And there's a guy standing there through the trees. And he's holding a rifle. Right now I'm in my pajamas still, my thermal underwear. I think, well, I better put my pants on for this. Right. So I put my pants on, go out there and talk to him. He's gone. So I'm like, ah, it's time to go anyway. I start packing. It's just like 11, getting close to noon or whatever. Might even have been afternoon. I remember. And a bunch of cops pull in and they got the little guy with them. And the cops get out. And he says, what you doing? I says, well, I camped right there. You can still see my tent up. I says, I'm right there. I just stayed the night here. The cop goes, we, we're going to go look at your camps. They go look. I'm like, all right, they come back. Guy says, you're a gringo. I'm like, yeah. He says, okay, we'll see you later. We'll see you later. <laughs> they take off. Yeah, because there's a lot more freedom in Mexico. So they take off. And a little while later, the guy comes back, the little guy who had the gun. He had a rifle. He was holding the rifle. And he what didn't have the, the rifle with him no more. And I says to him, I says, is this your land? He says, yeah. I said, was it okay? Are you up mad? He says, no. He says, I came by just to tell you that you can stay here anytime you want for as long as you want. <laughs> that was last year. Well, I seen, yeah, uh, I, was, I seen where you were behind that little billboard or whatever it was. And uh, what was it? Ten bucks that you had to throw their way. <laughs> yeah, I could tell them stories for the whole show. You guys, you know, the rich girl I met down in Oaxaca and lived in the big house with the servants for a couple of months and she paid for everything. So that was a typical poor uh, gringo, poor American white boy meets rich Mexican girl story. 
And she put a tire on my, I mean, I could tell them stories for days, you know, and I've got servants bringing me breakfast and coffee in the morning because everybody down there with money has a servant because they're cheap. She had a three bedroom, three story house built on the side of money all banned for the view of the city. I, you know, I could go into those stories for the rest of the day. I, I want to say this, Dark Soul, but it's something that you were talking about sparked it. This was my experience, okay? Once in a while, I get a guy comes on my stuff, and he says, you're just some kind of a mooch or a leech or a bum or whatever, which really kind of pisses me off. You're always going to get trolls. Because if you ever seen me work to rallies, you know I work my balls off. But the reason is is because I don't own much. He were, most people work for their bills. So I wanted to say that when I moved into my trailer, which is what really set me free, I, hitting the road was not what got me out of the rat race. What got me out of the rat race, hitting the road was a byproduct of first getting out of the rat race. So what I learned in that, I probably talked about this on another video, but the way I seen it was it's like, it's life, it's like a scale, man. On one side, you got stuff, and in the other side, you got freedom. And the more I put in one, the more I gave up of the other. There was no gain. It was simply a choice. When I told my dad I'm getting out of this big house, you know, I just left that house with everything in it. I loaded my truck up and left. But I told my dad I'm getting out. He said, you're, you're making a mistake leaving all this success, son. And, and, I, and I was like, what do you know of success? My dad was never very successful, right? <laughs> but uh, too much, you know. But uh, that was the point is more stuff. For me, equals less freedom. Even my rich friends. I have friends that are rich tell me their stuff owns them. They have to run around to hold their empire together. So for everything that I got rid of, just tilted the scale more. Than every, I don't care if it was a knickknack on my shelf. It tilted it a little more and a little more to a point of where my material needs were simple and taken care of. My little trailer had everything and even air conditioning. And, uh, but I had a lot of time and I still had money. So it's a, it's a trade, trade for stuff. That was my experience with it. What is your favorite rally to work throughout those years as you were doing that? Well, working a rally is never my favorite thing because it ruins the rally for you. Any of you guys ever work any of the booths? I worked changing tires for all those years, which is a grunt young man's job, but it pays a lot. Um, but all you see is the inside of your tent. You know what I mean? You get off work, you're tired, you get something to eat, get a shower, go home, maybe get to socialize for a couple minutes, and you got to get some sleep to do it again. But of the big rallies, Sturgis was always my favorite, and we've always made the most money there, too, because we get paid by the job, not the hour. So we have a lot of constant work there. So that would be my favorite. I like the Leesburg rally. I hear they canceled it this year in Florida. So <laughs> I don't know. Jack in the chat room just said, uh, we have to ask this one. Scotty has had more girlfriends than most dudes have miles on their speedometer. <laughs> <laughs> That's a past thing. That's a past thing for me. I'm pretty old now, and I'm kind of set in my ways and how you get. But that is true. They were a major part of it. As a matter of fact, Stan, the editor for Biker Magazine, he wanted me to call my column Scotty's Tales, T-A-I-L-S, because I was to give him so many stories with women in them. But I, <laughs> yeah, but I, I mean, I hate to sound pompous, but it's just the truth. I was really good looking in my youth. I, I worked as a, in, as in male exotic club for a while. You know? So that helped because I never did have any game. Yeah, if I showed you pictures, you'd know. You'd be like, what the fuck? <laughs> hey, so, I yeah, people it's true. Them so them that them helped, too. man. So, yeah, that was that was great, meeting women all over the place. And you know what's the coolest part about that is the, 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 the romance part is always the good part, right? I'd meet them. I stayed with them for a month or six weeks or something. I'd take off. But, and, I mean, that's still the part where you're getting breakfast in bed. You're getting – you know, blowjobs in the morning and nobody's farting under the covers. You know what I mean? Everything's good. It gets weird after a while, right? And so then I'd hit the road. And maybe she'd be there when I got back. Maybe she got an old man. But I didn't have to hang around for the part that gets to be hard, you know? That, that's the honest truth. I'm, I mean, I'm telling you the honest truth. That was, that was the best times for women of my life because, you know, I took off before it got bad. Right. Uh, I got a question for you. Have you ever 
ventured on up north to Canada? Sure. First Easy Rider story I ever did was about a Canadian girl. <laughs> the one I first one I ever got in Easy Rider. Yeah. I wanted to go back there before they closed the border to us. I was going back that year. Yeah, you been to Canada? I haven't. Not yet. One day. Windsor. Yeah, I've been to Windsor back in the 90s when you didn't need uh, passports and all that. Right, right. Yeah, that's. I used to go there before you needed the passport, too. But, uh, you know, Canada is not that much different than the U.S. I mean, it's not like a radical change. Maybe it's the same language, maybe some more accents. The money's different colors, and they don't have really have interstates. Other than that, there's a few differences, but not much. When you cross the border, border of Mexico, you just left the planet, brother. Oh, I've been, <laughs> I've been to Tijuana quite a few times. <laughs> <laughs> Even in Tijuana, you just went into a different world. Oh, yeah. But it really gets to be Mexico. I usually don't stop till I'm about 500 miles in. I go in and just kind of keep traveling every day, and I don't start stopping until I'm way down there. It begins to turn more like old Mexico. Probably safer that way, too. Now well, I think, I think Mexico is probably about as dangerous as the United States. Now, the, the idea that Mexico is dangerous is a prime example, a prime example of the media putting of the power they have to make us think the way they want. Mm -hmm. because like Joe went down there with me a year, three winters ago and he was went cause he was afraid to go alone. And I've had another, I had that happen with another guy too. And three weeks in, he left me and he took off, went to Guatemala. He's a young guy. Some people put him to, gave him a job working in a resort painting. I think they gave him room and board and he learned a few words of Spanish and he starts banging all these Guatemalan girls because he's exotic because he's American. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, he, and he ends up showing up. I went to Playa del Carmen, and he went to Guatemala. And um, and he ended up showing up there, and he has studied Spanish, and he's back there now. I just talked to him today. He's so happy to be back there where he can be free and he can feel safe, and the food's cheap, and there's so much more freedom in Mexico. It's like being here in the 60s was wow. you go in the restaurant you want to have a smoke they'll just bring you an ashtray you got your dog with i mean unless it's some fancy place or maybe in a big city but you want to bring your dog in you're barefoot you got no shirt on you want to park your van on the beach and go because you're a surfer and live in it man they don't care you can do that people are just leave each other alone so the, that kind of freedom is easy to get used to mm -hmm. and I, i'm sure there's as much danger as we have here I think there's probably as much, you know, right. I haven't had anything really bad happen. It's just everything is so different. You have to get used to the different differences. <laughs> That's my experience. That's my personal experience. Somebody else may tell you something else. Do you pack when you're down there or even when you're in the States when you're traveling? No. Mm -mm. Never have. Okay. Well, one more round, Scotty, and we'll let you go. Uh, my question, uh, final question, would be: You've been on the road so long, motorcycle safety. I'm. I bet you've seen some uh, stuff out there. You mean like wrecks? Yeah, wrecks. Or how do you uh, prepare yourself? Uh, are you more cautious now than you were when you were younger? Have you dropped the bike, ate the asphalt, all that stuff? <laughs> you know how I got this bike was a friend of mine I was traveling with a friend of mine on a gold wing and he rear-ended me in Pueblo, Colorado splattered us both in the road broke some of his ribs messed my bike up pretty good his wasn't too bad he hit me with a gold wing I got rear-ended by a motorcycle <laughs> it's not that Charlie's a bad rider it's that we were both looking off to the left looking for a place to sleep and I stopped too fast and he hit me or I slowed down too fast but um, you know what happened? I had to put his tent up for him right there in the camp in the turnout because he couldn't ride. I had him move all the bikes and everything out of the road. So the cops, some lady pulls over. She says, you want me to call the police for it? I said, we got cell phones. Why make things worse? We don't need no God. Charlie never went to the hospital. So um, when the money came in, he was felt so bad. He's like, I'm going to pay for your bike getting fixed. I said, Charlie. He don't have no money, and I wasn't mad at him. It's just what happened. 
I said, look, why don't I hit your insurance company, see if I can get enough money to fix both our bikes. And he said, okay. And that's how I got this bike. <laughs> 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 kind of fell in my lap, you know. So what, <laughs> wait a minute, what was the question, though, about the accents? Oh, surprisingly enough, you guys, I ride like an old woman. I'm a pre pleasure rider. I, r I ride really well from riding all my life, probably like you guys do, too. And, uh, but I'm not into speed. I ride really easy. I'm the easiest on my engines. I'm a pleasure rider. I want to, I want to take in the sights and enjoy the ride. That's what I'm in it for. Rock so on. I'm hey, not speeding around anyway. And as all you, all of us who've been riding a long time, you you learn how to judge the traffic, not be in the blind spot, all of that stuff. You know, you have to think for them. We all do it. We all have to do that. Otherwise, you're not going to ride too long. You know. <laughs> Right. You gotta learn learn the game. Right, yeah. Hey, I'll, man, be honest with you. I'll be honest with you. I'm the same way, Scotty. It's, uh, I'm I'm just cruising along the speed limit and making sure that I'm safe. And uh, speaking of, do you ever uh, wear full face helmets or anything like that? Nope. <laughs> and sometimes when it's really hot out, I ride barefoot in sandals. And I'll tell you, <laughs> I'll tell you my viewers, I did that once through LA traffic. You know, I'm riding with one hand going between the cars because they you can split lits, uh, you must lane the split there legally. And I'm holding the camera, riding with one hand, and I aim it at my feet. I'm wearing sandals. Oh, everybody got uptight about that. But it, the deal is it was okay. You know why? Because they were motorcycle sandals. <laughs> that's what i call them they're motorcycle sandals you guys it's okay no man no when, i'm pretty old and um when i was young i worked in a very dangerous job and we didn't have that be safe thing you know uh you know the way everybody says be safe nowadays right we, that you any guys remember that before the 90s or even in the 90s you remember hearing that we didn't used to have that okay no. Okay, the whole be safe thing was started by the media. This whole be a scared. Uh, the, uh, Americans have become way more afraid than we used to be of everything. I've watched it happen, and I've never been very affected by the media. I'm like, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to trust my guardian angels and go enjoy my life. And they sold it. They sold it as being the responsible adult, right? But I'm going to tell you something. I think being afraid to go out and, and take the chances that it takes for you to do your time in this world, for you to do your life, for a person to do their life, I think being afraid to do that is one of the most irresponsible fucking things you can do. Exactly. So that's, that's been sold to us. And when we were younger, you guys are probably most, most of you look old enough to remember before we had this. You're damn People right. People took their chances and they went out and lived their lives and they did – things that were dangerous and they lived through it and you wondered why because they had a good i don't know they had a good guardian angel i don't know but i'm not doing it i'm not into this be safe thing i'm not interested in it i'm going to take my chances i may pay one day for it i may get really bad road rash when it's hot out man i'll strip down i want to enjoy that ride i can't enjoy it dressed up like that you be wearing leathers and a full face helmet on a hundred degree day. You're gonna need that stuff, and you could eat stroke and bounce off the pavement. You know, <laughs> you when your brain gets like working. That's my take on it. That's my personal take on it. I'm not telling everybody to think like that, but that's how I see it. Hmm. Ride your ride, correct? Hey, man, how many guys do you know who took big chances in their lives that have lived to be old, and how many people died young from some weird mishap? One of my friends I used to work with way back when I was in my 20s in the roofing business, he went on to become a stuntman. I run into him a couple of years ago at a rally, and he was doing motorcycle stunts. He's worked for Hollywood. He got involved in, in Hollywood stunts. And me and him talked for a while. You know, he's a few years older than me. You know, his brother died in a fishing accident when the boat sank. But Monty Perlin is his name. He's still alive. Wow. Oh, wow. That's so, I mean, how many – there's people that live through things that should have killed five people and other guys die from things that shouldn't have killed them at all. So I'm not buying this idea that if you're really safe, somehow you're going to affect that you're going to live longer or live forever. I just – I'm not into it. I'm not into the safety thing, man. I'm not interested in it. I don't, I don't want to do it. Now, I'm not being stupid, of course, you know. 
Hey, hey, right. Give me one second. I don't want to be safe here a second. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to cause controversy with this one, right? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's somebody in the panel that don't like me doing it. But anyway, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> um, yeah, I totally get the safety part. But, you know, because just like in your camping, I can understand why you're not carrying or why you wouldn't carry that where Graystar was getting at as far as, you know, weapon-wise and so forth, because if you get in a, you know, a law predicament, you know, where one of the boys, you know, bears or whatever, law enforcement, let's just say, you know, stops you and they end up doing a search, I can totally understand. And, you, you know, but, uh, yeah, I'm not into the safety thing anyway, too. <laughs> totally agree. You, <laughs> you, you got to live your life as you can. You're already, it's like I tell these guys, you're already riding on a full tank of gas that could turn into a fireball. <laughs> so that's what it boils down to. <laughs> we took crazy chances when we were young, remember? Yeah. I don't know if you're yeah. old enough. I'm 61, so I, I was a teenager through the 70s. Nobody said be safe. There was no emphasis on that ever. But, there still isn't that way in Mexico. Most of the people I'm around, they don't think about that. So well, I don't I, know. I, don't. That's a new thing. I think it was media made. I, I really believe it was media made. Mm. Not being stupid is one thing, you know. Yeah. But being oh, afraid well, to do the things you want to do and then not doing them because of it. Yeah. It's all about logistics and logic right there. <laughs> you know, Jack, playing smart or dumb. <laughs> Jack says, Scotty, uh, from. Uh, the chat, Scotty is an inspiration for just not riding, but living. Yeah, that popped up on my thanks, Jack, I think. I'm going to tell you something, Jack. If you think I'm your, I know something, I have guys sometimes like think I'm some kind of a guru, right? I swear to God, I get this. And then you know what I tell them? I'm like, who's your guru, man? I'm a 61-year-old homeless guy with an old motorcycle and a sleeping bag. You might want to rethink this. <laughs> no, but thanks, Jack. I'm just kidding. I'm just All kidding. Right, what, I got one question. I'm, my last question for you, Scotty. You know, if, if there was one conversation you could have with anyone, dead or alive, who would it be? I think, uh, could the conversation involve a gun? <laughs> <laughs> it would be with Bill Gates. <laughs> oh, yeah. Go ahead. No, I don't know. I really don't know. Do you have somebody you would like to talk to with? Oh, man. Uh, what I would say is I wish I had a time capsule that I'd go back to uh, before, well, during the signing of the Declaration of Independence and after the Revolutionary War and tell all of them, instead, of, you know, you fought a monarchy. Instead, you created one with no term limits and stuff like that. Uh, yeah, man. <laughs> That's what I would. getting scary. <laughs> Go ahead, Dark <laughs> Soul. <laughs> yeah, you're going to be getting into a deep subject right there, Hollywood. Uh, oh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I can't really think of who I'd like to talk to. I can't think of. Dude, I'm sure there's somebody. It's just that question caught me off guard. <laughs> I really don't have much else to say. You have pretty much brought to life what a lot of us would like to do. And gratitude. Gratitude for you wake up a lot of people uh one of your videos you posted out there is about this COVID stuff and how blind people are and there's basically got blinders on you know they need to wake up before it's really too late well you guys know how many pandemics we've had this century in this century alone five five this is the third corona pandemic now, I tell people, they go, really? I'm like, if you don't remember the others, it's probably because the media didn't tell you to. This is media made. We've had three corona pandemics so far. We had SARS in 2002. We had H1N1 and this. They've all been corona. And I've lived through seven. 
because the one that got the most I know of is probably the AIDS, the AIDS pandemic. And then we had the Hong Kong flu in 68 and 69. I went to school every day. They had the, the Woodstock Musical Festival during that time. You know, this whole, no, there's something else going on. Mm -hmm. I tell guys, I tell young guys a lot when I have the opportunity, I tell them, look, man, if there's anything I can tell you coming from my age to yours that I hope you take with you for the rest of your life, that is to always, always, always question authority. If what you're seeing with your own eyes and your own brain is different from what they're telling you, go with your own eyes and your brain. It's called thinking for yourself. A friend, a guy just came to visit me and he camped tonight here and we got to talking and he said the same thing. He's an older guy. You know what I did when they started this whole C virus thing. The television's telling me everybody's sick, everybody's dying. Oh my God, oh my God. I'm like, really? I'm supposed to believe that? You know? So I want to see this. I start going to the hospitals. I've been to 20 or 30 hospitals. I've been to New Orleans, Houston, right in the middle of all this crap, man. I went downtown Houston. I looked at their hospitals. I went to their main one. There wasn't, and then I tried the small ones in the small towns. There wasn't nothing going on. These places were empty. They didn't have hardly anybody there. I tried to talk to the medical personnel. The medical personnel would walk right by me. Then a couple, one or one of them did stop, and he told me, I can lose my job talking to you. But I did talk to them in private, and they told me, look, they're laying people off in there. So I'm like, nobody thought. And this guy who came to visit me, he did exactly the same thing. And then what we did, because who's financing this whole thing, is the central banking system and, uh, the, Roth and uh, the corporations. You can learn about all that. And so what I started doing and he started doing immediately was boycotting corporations as much as possible and supporting mom and pop. I do that right now to this day. I look for the mom and pop restaurants. I look for the mom and pop gas stations. I look for them and I find them. And if everybody had been doing that, guess what? Walmart would be out of business by now. We would have hit them where it hurt. Damn right. Great we would hit One them last. where it actually hurt. We would show them we're not fucking having it. You know, if the restaurants, if the businesses would have stayed open and we just all started going to them, we would have Amen, sent brother. a big message. United Maybe States. I shouldn't talk like about that. <laughs> Back to motorcycles. <laughs> yeah, <you're gonna laughs> See, you started. brought it up, Hollywood. You brought it up. <laughs> <laughs> hey, so you had mentioned that you're going to do a cam on your Evo. I used to have a 95 Fat Boy that had an 88 cubic inch Evo in it. And it was dog slow. I could barely get it to 80 miles an hour with somebody on the back. So I'm really interested in seeing you do this cam. So please video it for me. <laughs> you, you still have this bike? I don't, but I'm thinking about getting another one. Another Evo? Yeah. If you got questions about putting it in, if I, if, hopefully I'll get around to making this. <laughs> if I don't, you can always call and ask me. Okay. Hey, we were talking about earlier, Scotty. Yeah, I want I want that video too. Yep. See, there you there's go. just like two things you need to know about it. One's the main one I can tell you right now, and so everybody can know this who wants to put a cam in their Evo. Is one of the things that's not so commonly known even back then is that there's a gear on the end of the cam that drives it. Those come in different sizes, minutely different sizes. I think there's four different color codes for them, and they're matched to the pinion gear on the shaft on the main shaft on the engine, and that's and those two gears have to be matched to each other. When you buy a new cam, it comes with a gear on it. So what everybody would do who was in the know is press. You just take it to a shop, have them do it. it doesn't cost much. Press the gear off the new cam you bought, and press the gear off your original one that the factory set up onto the new cam, because trying to set them up is a hard process. I had to do it on this one, and I'm not using the hard process that's in the book. I'm doing it the hillbilly. I did it the hillbilly way because this bike had an aftermarket cam, but usually you're taking out a stock one. So you always want to use the gear that came on the original cam. If it's too big, it will break the gear. I had it happen once. A shot put it in. And if the gear is too small, you'll get a whole lot of valve clatter. It'll just sound like your valves are really loud, but it won't hurt nothing. So that's, that's the main thing. Okay. Rock that nobody knows. So now you know that one. If you ever got to do it, anybody out there, be sure you do that. Awesome. The well, one thing Scotty, that I don't think is in the book. Well, Scotty, I really appreciate you coming on, man. We all look to to you. We live through you in your videos. You live uh, 
an awesome lifestyle, man. A lot of us uh, really wish we could live something like that. Uh, I personally love all your Mexico uh, videos. Uh, it's just a different uh, life down there, as you said. And Insane Throttle's really happy that you came on, gave uh, your stories, and uh, gave some advice uh, to people that uh, might want to do this. Yeah, anybody can contact me. You know, I get too many messages now to respond to them all. But the ones I do, people that want to get a hold of me, I end up giving them my phone number. Anybody can talk to me or people come visit. You know, I have people come hang out, stay with me. I'm always open to that. One of my reasons for getting in this was to share my passion with people who have a similar passion. Right on. Hey, so I like to be available. If I can be available, I am, you know. Next summer, right. time, if you're ever out near Utah, look me up. That's where I'm at. <laughs> you got a place to stay. All right, yeah, Grace Star. You got my phone number. You know, if you send me the your your uh, if you like text me or be sure to put your name, town name, and phone number. I'll put it in my phone for when I'm out there. All right, we'll do. I put it by state. You know, I put the state in, and then I'll look for the Utah, and then I'll be like, "Hey, there's Grace Star. I remember that guy." There you go. <laughs> Cool. Well, thanks, uh, guys. Great uh, panel tonight. Uh, again, if you want to uh, talk to Scotty, you know how to do it. Uh, but if you're not subscribed to his channel, something's wrong with you guys. If you're not uh, subscribed, <laughs> <laughs> hey, anyway, uh, <laughs> go ahead, Scott. You guys are gonna send me a link to this, right? You to download this if you want to put on your channel too. I don't know how to do it. Can I download? You know, if you have it on Odyssey, I can download it. I don't know how to download off of YouTube. Yeah, it's going to be uh, going on Odyssey as well. But uh, what I'll do is have J-Man uh, send you a link to uh, a free uh, web thing where you just put in the link and it downloads for you. Well, you know, you probably know this. When you set up an Odyssey account, it has an option where, where everything you put onto YouTube is automatically mirrored over there. All right, yeah, I don't know if you're using that. I use that. Right. So everything goes up there. But they've got a button on there you can download, right? What's on there? I don't know if oh, you knew okay. that. I just, I just found that recently. Mess around with the buttons right below it. There's only like two of them. And you'll see one that says download. You can download anything off of there. So I already know yeah. how to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's going to be on Odyssey. I know that as soon as it goes through uh, the YouTube thing. Uh, yeah, send me the YouTube link and Odyssey. Sounds you can download good, man. It. All awesome. right, guys. Appreciate everything, right. Scotty. You're awesome, my man. It's all been right, a pleasure, man. you guys. I hope I get to talk to y'all again. Yeah, I'll send you my information, Scotty. If you're ever in yeah, St. Louis, yeah. so. <laughs> Be sure to remind me. Well, these yeah. you guys got these crazy names, I should remember. We all got crazy names. Look at mine. <laughs> Awesome. You know, oh, cool. <laughs> well, yeah, if you're in Illinois, man, same thing. Yep. Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, talk to you I later, Scott. State, town, and phone number. I get near the, in the state, I'll look up the state, I get near the town, then I can call you. Rock and roll, man. All right. All right cool. Talk to you later, All Scotty. right, guys. Peace out. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for being on. Oh, thanks for having me. You're oh, man, welcome. It pleasure. Time, man. <laughs> been a pleasure. It's been an absolute pleasure, you guys. Thanks, buddy. So what do you guys think, man? Uh, Scooter Scramp Scotty, man. He is the asphalt god, man. You know, he's tore up some miles. That is just awesome stuff. We appreciate you guys uh, tuning in today. Next uh, Saturday, we got uh, Danny B. Low on. And what are we talking about, guys, next week? I think we're going to talk about customization. Bike builders. <laughs> Rock and roll. Don't forget to join the Discord server, guys. I put the link in the uh, chat room just like now. You guys can go over there, have fun, the whole nine yards. But we're out of here. Talk to you guys later. Yeah.